Hi folks, in our continuation of sonnets and Renaissance poetry today, we are going to meet the man, the myth, the legend, William Shakespeare. Now, I'm sure you've studied Shakespeare before in high school. Um, you don't get the senior year without doing, you know, Romeo and Juliet and maybe uh, Julius Caesar and, you know, some other stuff. So I don't need to need to spend a ton of time uh, hitting you with the bio of William Shakespeare, but it is important to remember a few details that will help you understand his sonnets. Um, so, uh, first things first, uh, William Shakespeare, we think, was born on, on 26th of April, 1564, um, and he died on, in, in 1616. He's most famous today, of course, for his plays, which uh, are studied and produced still. Uh, but when he was alive, he was more famous for his sonnets than for his plays. But his sonnets were somewhat unconventional. Um, they've become, through the ages, some of the most loved sonnets that, that ever were. But uh, during the time period... You know, you look at, at what Shakespeare does and you compare it to, say, what Sidney does or what Spencer does, his rhymes are less um, intricate. His uh, use of literary devices, you're going to find that he has, has fewer metaphors and, and um, similes and oxymorons and paradoxes and, and those sorts of things. You're also going to find that um, he doesn't write about unrequited love. He writes about relationships that he's actually in. And so he breaks some rules. And he actually breaks more rules as he goes through his sonnets. So when we get to like Sonnet 130, he's going to write sort of an anti-sonnet that, that kind of mocks the sonnet genre um, in, in the form of a sonnet, which is, is fun. Um, anyway, he was born in Stratford-on-Avon. Uh, his dad was a glove maker. Uh, but apparently a, a relatively charismatic guy because at one point he became the mayor of the town. Um, his mother was a, a member of what well, was a landed woman. So, so when Shakespeare's dad married her, uh, he got some land. Uh, and so Shakespeare, we think, went to the local grammar school, which would explain his education and his knowledge of, of Latin and, um, you know, those sorts of things. Uh, the big thing with Shakespeare that most people talk about is that Shakespeare's wife is a woman named Anne Hathaway, not the actress Anne Hathaway. <laughs> Although that's her real name. I looked it up. I was like, no, it, she doesn't have the same name as, as Shakespeare's wife. Yeah, yeah, she does. Anyway, uh, he was he was 18 and she was 26, I, I believe. And so um, there was a relatively big age gap between them. Uh, especially for the time period when 26 was, was relatively old. People only lived to be 50, so she was like middle-aged, I guess, by, by the standards of the day. Um, and uh, so Shakespeare married her. It was probably, you know, they, I think they had a kid like eight months later, so you can do the math on that and figure out uh, what's going on. Uh, also, uh, you know, we tend to, I don't know why we do this, but um, especially literature books, if you have any kind of literature book, they sort of whitewash um, literary figures. Uh, Shakespeare did get married to Anne Hathaway. He had um, three children with her. Um, I'm trying to remember the names. Um, Judith, Hamnet, and uh, um, there was another one. And Emily? I, I, don't, I don't remember off the top of my head. It's in here, I'm sure. Uh, I highly recommend checking out the Wikipedia page and, and looking it up. Um, and going through. Um, he did have tragedies. His one son died of sickness. Uh, but but the part that bothers me about, um, you know, any any book that you read about, any school book, sanitized school book you read about Shakespeare, it makes him seem like a great dad and father and a good person overall. And, you know, clearly he's a complicated, all of these authors are, are human beings and learning about their past um, helps you understand, I think, the human condition. Uh, while he, his, his first two children were still toddlers, Shakespeare left. Uh, he left Stratford. He moved to London uh, because he always felt like he was going to make it big in the playwriting industry. And I guess to quote Alexander Hamilton, he wanted to take his shot. Uh, but that would be the equivalent of like, if I got married and had kids, and then I told my wife, I always thought I could make it in Hollywood and just like go across country and, and live. Um, Shakespeare, Shakespeare moved to, um, London. He didn't know anybody in the theater industry. He got a, he got his first job at the theater holding horses. Um, essentially he was, um, a valet, you know, valet parking outside the theater. He was good at making small talk. He made a good impression with people. Um, and he did finally get a big break. The 
uh, play, the owner of the playhouse that, that he was parking horses outside. I've got a couple of plays, I guess, in that were absolutely terrible. And uh, he gave Shakespeare a chance to rewrite them and, and he earned himself a writing spot. Uh, and then he started acting and then he got a patron uh, and then he was able to build the Globe Theater and put on his own plays and, you know, like things sort of exploded and things went really, really well for him. He always was married to Anne Hathaway. Um, he, he kept going back and seeing her, you know, he took care of his family financially after he made it. Um, you know, all of that's true, but also if, if he had, I don't know, a Facebook status about his relationship with Anne Hathaway, it would be, it's complicated because she almost certainly cheated on him. There's all kinds of interesting, uh, theories and information out there. Some people even speculate that she cheated on him with his brother. Uh, but it's not like he's a great person either. He clearly had mistresses. Um, some of them we even think we know the names of, uh, like Amelia Lanyard, a, a famous poet, uh, from the time period. And, um, so, you know, we love to hold Shakespeare up as this paragon of love and virtue uh, because he writes about love and virtue and he does it so powerfully in so many of his plays and so many of his sonnets. But the reality is uh, that he was a man and a flawed man and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, let's see, what, what other fun tidbits about Shakespeare do you want to know? Um, oh, yeah, they, uh, Shakespeare is not um, buried in Poet's Corner in... Um, Westminster Abbey because he wasn't super famous during his day. Plays were sort of viewed as throwaway entertainment. They were viewed like we would view sitcoms nowadays. Uh, people never thought they would become, you know, things that people would watch and, and study and learn from and all of that kind of stuff. So it's it's sort of interesting in that way. They actually, for his 200th, um, I don't know, 200th birthday, I guess, they 200th anniversary of his death, I guess, uh, they decided to take a... Um, like a sonic image of his corpse inside its grave, which I, it's kind of creepy to me. But anyway, what they discovered was that his skull is not there. Uh, and so people went back and they looked at like historical records. And apparently there is a story from um, the late um, 1700s, I think, about somebody like exhuming and stealing Shakespeare's skull. So apparently his skull's out there somewhere. That's that's kind of interesting. Um he mostly wanted to write plays. He wasn't he wasn't incredibly interested in writing sonnets. The reason he has so many sonnets is because he was a prolific writer and uh for because of the plague hitting London, um the theaters were all closed down. So he wrote a lot of his sonnets. He has 156 sonnets. Uh he wrote a lot of his sonnets during the plague year, uh which I guess is somewhat appropriate now after we've all dealt with quarantine, we can we can sort of understand and sympathize with that. Anyway, I, I guess that's enough on Shakespeare to go with. Um, you know, he's a, he's a really, really, really famous guy, probably the most famous writer in history, period. Uh, so, um, everybody knows his name. Everybody runs into him. Everybody studies him and it's worth reading about his life, about his background. But, you know, the Wikipedia page is only, is only one little bit of the incredible amount of volumes and volumes and volumes of, of things that have been written on the man over the years. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut up about this and we'll move on to the sonnet we're going to look at today. Uh, we're going to look at one of Shakespeare's early sonnets. Um, then we'll look at a couple of later ones um, next class. Uh, sonnet 29 is, uh, you can sort of place it when you, when you look at it. It's one of his early sonnets, but also uh, it was written to Anne Hathaway almost, almost certainly. Uh, and given the context of the poem, what it says, it was probably written during that time period in which he was parking horses in London. Um, let me read it out to you from beginning to end. Um, then we'll do the rhyme scheme. We'll look at all the kinds of things that you would normally look at with sonnets and we'll run through it. But I'll do it relatively quickly because I've already spoken for nine minutes. So Sonnet 29 by William Shakespeare. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope with what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising, haply I think on thee, and then my state, like to the lark at the break of day arising from sullen earth sings hymn hymns at heaven's gates for thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings that then i scorn to change my state with kings 
Okay, so it sounds like a nice little sonnet. Let's let's take a look at our rhyme scheme. Eyes is going to be an A. State is a B. Doesn't rhyme with eyes. Cries rhymes with eyes. That's an A. Fate is a B. Goes with state. Hope is brand new. That's a C. Possessed is new. That's a D. Scope goes with hope. Lest goes with possessed. Now, you'd say least, uh, but you got to read it with a British accent. Um, hey, speaking of the British accent, uh, something fun. Hold on, i got to pause this and open a Wikipedia page. Something fun, historically, but difficult in terms of, of reading Renaissance poetry, is that this thing called the Great Vowel Shift happened in England. Um, the Great Vowel Shift was a series of changes in the pronunciation of the English language that took place primarily between 1400 and 1700, beginning in southern England, uh, and today having influenced effectively all dialects of English. Uh, through this vowel shift, the pronunciation of all Middle English long vowels was changed. Uh, some consonant sounds changed as well, particularly those that became silent. Uh, so the way that vowels were pronounced um, changed almost entirely over the span of 300 years. And uh, so, but it was a slow process. And so when you're trying to read Renaissance poetry without translation, a lot of times the vowels like louve instead of love, uh, love can rhyme with prove. Uh, and, and stuff like that. And so you'll see these things. And one thing that you want to want to pay attention to is that uh, they would have been pronounced differently back in the day. And if you're interested, you can come and you can look up at um, how the vowels changed. And like if you're a linguist, if you're interested in going into into language. Um, but yes, um, least would have been less and uh, Possessed would, would still be possessed. So you got A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. Despising is brand new. That's an E. State does not rhyme. Well, it technically rhymes with fate and state. So we've got a B again. And arising is going to go with despising. And gate is going to go with state. And then brings and kings is going to be new F, F. So this is an early Shakespeare sonnet. If you go back to Renaissance literature and you look for sonnet types, uh, a Shakespearean or English sonnet is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Uh, Shakespeare doesn't quite do that here. He's got A, B, A, B, that's definitely a quatrain. C, D, C, D, that's definitely a quatrain. E, B, E, B. Uh, is definitely a quatrain as well. It seems to have an interlock with the first um, quatrain, but there's no clear connection. The, the rhymes don't run throughout. It's just sort of like he uses the same one here. Uh, so it's, I think it's kind of clunky compared to like Spencer or Sydney or what they were doing. Um, and then we got a couplet at the end. So, um, we're going to go through and look at each quatrain, um, by itself here and try and make sense of it. Uh, so Shakespeare starts out, when in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes. Uh, being dis in disgrace with fortune is kind of a personification, like fortune means wealth or, or fame, one of the two things, and men's eyes is the way people look at him. So you can picture Shakespeare being a valet parking horses outside of a theater. Uh, he doesn't have any money, he's in disgrace with fortune. And nobody looks at a valet with respect, you know, so he's he's feeling like low and disrespected. He says, I all alone be weep, be weep being just cry about my outcast state. So Shakespeare's feeling like an outcast. Um, he feels alone. And, and I think there's something to be said for that. He just moved to London. Sometimes, you know, you feel more alone in a city surrounded by people than you do when you're alone. Why? Because in a city, when you don't know anybody, the idea of comradeship, the idea of, of friends and, and, you know, all of that is sort of shoved in your face in a way that it isn't when you're alone. Look at all the people and I know none of them, you know, so he's all alone, beweeps his outcast state um, and troubles deaf heaven. That's a personification. I'll, I'll italicize, um, I'll italicize, uh, figurative language. Uh, heaven can't be deaf. I mean, but what he's saying is like he's he's troubling deaf heaven with his bootless cries. Now, bootless is an old word for fruitless or hopeless. Uh, so he's he's calling out to God. You get this image. He's like, why? Why does my life suck so bad? But heaven's deaf. God never responds to him. It's like he's talking to to a wall or something like that. So he's troubling deaf heaven with his his hopeless cries. And he looks upon himself and curses his fate. Uh, so Shakespeare looks at himself and he's like, God, 
God, Shakespeare, you're you're a mess. You're a disaster. Uh, so he's he seems very unhappy um, with his his state of life. That's what it means here. His state, his state of being, that sort of thing. So then uh, we move on to a second quatrain where he says, wishing me like to one more rich in hope. So he wishes he had higher hopes. Rich in hope is sort of a, a metaphor. Hope is not um, something that, you could be, that doesn't have wealth, but he's comparing it sort of to wealth, that there are people out there who are just more optimistic, more hopeful, who have, uh, I don't know, uh, privileges that, that he doesn't have. So he wishes that he, was, he had a, a better situation, uh, that he had more reason to be hopeful for his life. So here's Shakespeare sort of being pessimistic. Um, this whole this whole quatrain is sort of about um, Shakespeare wishing he was like other people, uh, wishing he could trade places with other people. He says, "Featured like him, like him with friends possessed." So he wishes that he was more optimistic. He wishes that people were looking at his work that he was sort of featured. Uh, he wishes that he had more friends, uh, like like so and so who has who has more friends, desiring this man's art. He wishes he was more artistic. Uh, that he had. <laughs> that's, that's kind of funny. You're thinking about this is Shakespeare and he wishes he was more artistic. And that man's scope, he wishes he was more intelligent. Um, you know, he's looking at all the people he sees and, and wanting to trade places with them. This is crazy to me. I mean, and I guess maybe it should, should be reason for us to be hopeful in our lives. Here's Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, the, the most famous author in the history of authors. And early in his career, he wanted to trade places with other people. He was unhappy with himself. He cursed his own fate. Uh, he hated his situation. You can even see here with what I most enjoy content at least, it got to the point where he hated his own work. He'd write something and he'd be like, Whoa, and, and dislike it. Uh, so Shakespeare was really in a low place here uh, within these first two, I don't know, first two quatrains. Um, and I, I think also you can sort of see how this is an early sonnet because these first two quatrains are very separate in rhyme scheme, but they sort of count as a as a sestet. They sort of work as one unit of meaning, sorry, an octave. And then he has a quatrain and a couplet down here, but they're almost a reply to the first part. Um, and there's only one period in this whole thing, and it's down here at the end, so it makes the whole thing sort of one sentence. Also, when we're talking about Shakespeare and his early work and, and sort of the, the rhyme schemes and stuff, let's, let's take a quick look at sound devices, because you're going to see that there aren't a lot here. Uh, when in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, we got disgrace is a, a consonance and men's and eyes. So there is... A consonants up here, but there's no alliteration, there's no um, assonance in that line. I all alone, all alone is going to have assonance with itself here. Um, Beweep my outcast state. Outcast and state um, are going to have consonants with each other. And trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, bootless and cries. So he's making an effort here. We got we got some consonants. I haven't seen a single alliteration yet. And look upon myself and curse my fate. There's nothing in this line. I don't I don't see a thing. Um, yeah. So the the sound devices too are are a little less prominent than in some of the other um works wishing me like to one more rich in hope i don't see anything there featured like him like him with friends possessed featured friends there's an s on the end of that so desiring this man's this man's all right we're finally getting something here um man's art and art oh what did i just do um art i hit control n instead of control u and that both have a t sound at the end uh and this man's and man 
ends. I'll have the S sound at the end. So we have some stuff going on in that line. With what is a most with and what? They're kind of alliterations. Um, enjoy contented least. Uh, least has got that T sound too. So we've got some sound devices going on here, but nothing like what, what you look at with, um, you know, a Spencer or a, a Sydney Sonic. Um, so, all right, let's, let's read these first eight lines because they work together. When in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, he's feeling disgraced. I all alone beweep my outcast state. He's feeling alone and hopeless and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries. He's crying out to God uh, and look upon myself and curse my fate. He hates himself. Wishing me like to one more rich in hope, wishes he was more optimistic, featured like him, wishing that he was more famous, like him with friends possessed, wishing he had more friends, desiring this man's art, wishing he was more artistic, and that man's scope, wishing he was more intelligent, with what I most enjoy contented least. He hates his own work. Yet, so this yet signals a change. Uh, this this word right here is going to tell you when you're reading that there's going to be a change in tone. There's going to be a, a shift in subject. He says, yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising. It almost gets to the point where I hate myself, he says. I'm almost despising. Happily. Happily is an old word that means uh, randomly or by chance. Uh, so randomly or by chance, I think on thee. Now, thee is an old word for you, Right. So he thinks of you. Now, this that makes this son addressed to someone. It's someone that's not here. It's sort of a love letter that you write, but you never send. I mean, that's sort of what a sonnet is. Uh, but this this is different as opposed to uh, other sonnets, which are going to be an unrequited love. This is going to be about an actual love relationship. So randomly, I think of you and then my state. Again, same use as up here, the idea of, of his state of being, his internal state. Um, and here comes a simile. So we got this word like. Um, and I'm going to italicize it because I'm doing that with figurative language. Like to the lark at the break of day arising, from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. So that's kind of a complicated simile. But he says, when I think of you, whoever this you is, Anne Hathaway, his wife, probably, um, then his internal state of being changes. It's like the lark. A lark is a bird. It's a morning bird that starts singing beautiful songs as the sun's about to rise. The sun hasn't risen yet, but it's about to rise. Have you ever noticed this? Birds know how to do this, right? Like, it's not even bright outside yet, and the birds start singing because they know it's about to get bright, and they wake you up in the morning if you're sleeping with your windows open, and you're like, shut up, birds. But this is, this is the image that he's got. Like a bird that starts to sing because it knows the sun is going to rise. From sullen earth, this is a personification. Sullen means sad. Uh, the earth is sullen because it's nighttime. Uh, sings hymns at heaven's gate. Hymns is a religious word. So thinking of her as some sort of a religious experience that brings him all the way metaphorically to the gate of heaven. Um, right? And so what he says is, you know, I hate myself. I, I start thinking all these negative things about myself. I get to the point where I, I can't stand to even, even think about it. And then I think of you and I'm in a dark place, but just like those birds that know the sun is going to rise, my internal state of being starts becoming cheerful, starts singing. The sadness of my life gets exchanged for the gate of heaven. So she is the sun in this metaphor, um, you know, and his soul starts singing to her uh, when he thinks of her. So she is the sun to his life. She is the bright spot, you know, so it's a pretty romantic little thing here at the end. Uh, but Shakespeare likes to hit you with a resolution at the end of his sonnets. And he says, for your sweet love remembered such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my state with kings. And so this, this resolution down here at the end, um, can never squeeze, squeeze it in there. Uh, this resolution down here at the end, though, changes things a little bit. The whole poem has been about how Shakespeare wants to trade places with other people, you know, wishing he was this person or that person. But at the end, he says, I have your love. And because I have your love, I, I'm so rich. I'm so wealthy. We have that rich word up here. Um, and we, we bring it back with such wealth brings down here. Uh, I'm so rich in love 
that I would scorn to change my state with King. So he says at the end, love, I guess if you want to put a theme on this, love makes you wealthier than a king. If you offered to Ch Shakespeare to change places with the King of England, he would say no, because the King of England doesn't have her love. And so love is this, this thing that's more valuable than kingdoms. And um, it's not just that he would turn him down. It was, he would scorn. He would laugh at the offer to become king. Look at that word scorn. He'd be like, ha, no. Uh, right? And that's, that's what that word means. And so at the end of this, Shakespeare uh, makes it a love poem um, to a woman he's in a relationship with. He, he says it, your sweet love remembered. So they're, they're clearly in love. Uh, as opposed to an unrequited love situation. And uh, that love is more valuable to him than a kingdom. And all of the negative thoughts he has go away when he thinks about love. And so this is a poem about the value of love. It's an early sonnet. Uh, let me read it to you one more time in its entirety. And, um, you know, you can you can process it. And then we'll call this video done. When in... Oh, sorry. i got to go back. You, you need to always have the number so you can remember. Sonnet 29, William Shakespeare. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy contented least, yet in these thoughts myself almost despising, Happily, I think on thee. And then my state, like to the lark at the break of day arising, from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered, such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Great sonnet. Oh, I, I lied about turning it off. I forgot to say it is 14 lines in case you didn't do that one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So we've got to do that. We've got to check the, the iambic pentameter. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes. 10. I all alone be weep my outcast state. 10. So it fits uh, all of the requirements for a sonnet. Um, it's an early Shakespeare sonnet. He's still developing his form. He's still he's still figuring out um, what it is that he's trying to do. Uh, it's not as polished as some of the some of the other sonnet writers of the time period. But you'll note that when we get to our next one, which is Sonnet One Sixteen, Shakespeare has made great strides in his in his writing abilities in terms of uh, all of those other elements that you see in sonnets. Uh, but the one thing that I think um, is going to set Shakespeare apart, and you can already see it in this sonnet is that uh, Shakespeare writes with, with maturity. Uh, you know, maybe not maturity in terms of style and rhyme scheme, but maturity in terms of content. When you look at, say, you know, Spencer's Sonnet 30 uh, about fire and ice, or you look at uh, Sidney's Sonnet about sleep, uh, you know, and, and maybe it's, it's an effect of the unrequited love part of the genre. They come across as a little bit uh, pouty or whiny or or wishing and this one on the other hand even though he is sort of whining at the beginning about his state in life there's there's an assuredness about the love um that that comes across and i think you're going to see this through all of shakespeare's sonnets all right i'm going to shut this off i wanted to be under a under half an hour and i am so thanks